NBC Radio News on the Hour, Ron Nesson reporting. 30 men is reported to have landed in the center of Quang Tri City by helicopter. Other South Vietnamese troops with American advisors are said to have captured two nearby district towns and to be advancing through the outskirts of Quang Tri City from the east and southwest. North Vietnamese resistance has not been especially tough up to now, but it is said to be stiffening. Meanwhile, North Vietnamese soldiers continued to fire artillery and rockets at Way, raising fears that the communists might be letting the South Vietnamese advance on Quang Tri as a trick to pull away the defenses around Way. President Lyndon B. Johnson keeps the United States active in the war in Vietnam. The government does its best to keep the country in the dark about the war through the administration's policy of candor. The war will be a short one, they claim. 1968 will prove them wrong. This is the year the United States will face a bloody and brutal offensive as more about the war hits home to a disenchanted populace. That was pretty quiet where we were mostly, except for Tet 68, the end of January. And that's when all hell broke loose. As 1967 ends, North Vietnamese attacks throughout South Vietnam stretch Allied forces towards the demilitarized zone. Lok Ninh is attacked on October 29, 1967. Dak Tho on November 23, 1967. By mid-December, U.S. command turns sole defense over to the South Vietnamese's 5th Ranger Group. They are to be supported by the U.S.'s 2nd Battalion, 13th Artillery. The U.S. 2 Field Forces, a corps-like group made up of 39 battalions under the command of Lieutenant General Frederick C. Weyand is tasked with search and destroy of Viet Cong and North Vietnamese bases close to the Cambodian border. Weyand, a veteran of both World War II and the Korean War, is uneasy. Why aren't his soldiers encountering more enemy troops? Why is radio traffic surrounding Saigon greater than usual? Appealing to General Westmoreland, Weyand is allowed to call some of his forces back to the 29-mile Saigon Circle surrounding the city. Weyand, it will turn out, is prescient. January 21st, 1968. The Marine garrison at Khe San, remotely located in South Vietnam, has been fortified by General William Westmoreland of the U.S. Military Assistance Command in Vietnam. 6,000 Marines strong, Westmoreland fears Vietnamese forces will overtake the area to further strengthen their hold. On January 21st, the People's Army of North Vietnam strike with a bombardment of the base. 90% of the U.S. forces' artillery and mortar rounds are destroyed. 18 Marines are killed, with 40 wounded. President Johnson and General Westmoreland decide to hold the base and launch an offensive bombardment of the enemy forces near Khe Sanh. This first attack lasts for two days. The base, with its outpost, blocked the main avenue of approach into eastern Quang Tri province. The desired solution to the problem, using air mobile assaults in strength, was not possible owing to lack of both personnel and aircraft. Had they been available, the weather would have complicated such an operation before March or April. Not to be overlooked was the possibility of drawing a major enemy force into a position where it could be decisively destroyed. Another consideration in the decision was that the defense of Khe Sanh could be envisioned as a classic example of economy of force. It seemed certain that the two cracked North Vietnamese army divisions, which might have been used elsewhere in the province, could be contained by one reinforced Marine regiment with a major assist from air and artillery strikes. In addition to these two divisions, two other enemy divisions, held in reserve by the enemy, were never committed because the situation failed to develop 
in the enemy's favor. General Westmoreland had but two choices, to stay and reinforce or get out. He chose to stay. The Tet Offensive was also placing a strain on the supplies used by U.S. forces, averaging 2,600 tons of supplies a day, not counting petroleum. An additional 1,000 tons will be required to launch a counteroffensive to Quezon. When the enemy opened his Tet Offensive, he placed an additional burden on the U.S. supply system, then extant in i corps and already strained to the breaking point. Colonel Daniel F. Munster, a logistics officer for the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, determined the amount of supplies his units consumed each day and realized that he must have additional tonnage to reconstitute stocks and to build up for the counteroffensive to relieve Khe Son, which was tentatively planned to begin on the 1st of April, 1968. As the focus is kept on the Marine garrison in Khe Son, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces slowly gather in other areas of South Vietnam. January 30th, 1968. Meanwhile, 35 enemy battalions converge on Saigon with plans to take down six primary targets, ARVN HQ at Tan Son Nut Air Base, Independence Palace, the U.S. Embassy, the Long Bin Naval HQ, and the national radio station. Chillingly enough, this attack is part of a greater offensive staged by the combined forces of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese, and one that will prove more psychologically damaging to American morale and faith in the war than anything else. Ho Chi Minh knows that America will not withdraw their forces or negotiate until forced to. The cover for both the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces to stage an offensive is that of a holiday. And uh, then all of a sudden, um, one night we were sitting around and we see all these rockets and mortars coming in and tracers going out up at the Marine base there in Quantry and didn't know what was going on. And then we heard about what happened in Way but the first air cab was down there, the Marines were there, and it was big battles there. And we're sitting like up on the hill in the middle. We don't know what's going on. We, we, Tet, what is Tet? The most important Vietnamese holiday, Tet, brings with it a truce from fighting. The Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces exploit that, along with the diversion caused at Khe San. Disguising themselves as peasants, Many of them infiltrate villages and cities under the appearances of holiday travel. At 0130 hours, a 15-man Viet Cong platoon attacks the Imperial Plaza in Saigon. They manage to infiltrate the grounds, only to have eight members killed by heavy fire. General Weyen, his fears confirmed by the rash of attacks, dispatches close to 5,000 American troops into action during the two hours from 0300 to 0500 hours. He appoints his deputy commander, Major General Keith Ware, in charge of the forces being sent in. Ware is a World War II battalion commander and Medal of Honor recipient. At 0200 hours, the ARVN Joint General Staff Compound is attacked by a Viet Cong battalion. They fail to break through on their first attack but are soon reinforced by two more of their own battalions. At 0400, a truckload of MPs rush to support the American officer's billet near the ARVN HQ, but are ambushed by Viet Cong Company. The two sides exchange fire in an alley for 12 hours, ending in the deaths of 16 MPs and the wounding of 21. The Viet Cong do manage to breach the ARVN compound by 0930 hours, but are driven out by South Vietnamese paratroopers. An explosion rocks the outer wall of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon at 0247 hours. It creates a four-foot hole that lets the Viet Cong terrorists, numbering 19, pour in and attack the compound. When the siege of the U.S. Embassy is over by 0900 hours, 
four MPs, and one Marine are dead. Only one Viet Cong soldier survives. The South Vietnamese paratroopers at the national radio station are not so lucky. They arrived earlier to reinforce it from suspected enemy attack and opt to sleep on the roof. It is a fatal mistake. Viet Cong troopers fire down from an adjacent apartment building and kill every paratrooper in their sleep. They take the station with ease and prepare to play a pre-recorded tape that will broadcast and announce their general uprising and fall of Saigon to communist forces. They are foiled when a crew at the 14-mile distant transmission site is signaled to break the link. Around 70,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong take up arms against over 100 South Vietnamese cities and towns. The most brutal of the Tet Offensive is within the ancient walls of a thriving city. The city of Hue, situated only 31 miles from the demilitarized zone and along the Perfume River, is a vital supply line for the Army of the Republic of Vietnam and the U.S. It also serves as a base for the U.S. Navy. In spite of its importance, Hue remains poorly fortified and defended. North Vietnamese forces begin their attack at 0233 hours, taking the Tok Lok airfield, the ARVN headquarters, and U.S. Military Assistance Command Vietnam compound. The fighting is savage and bloody and ends with North Vietnamese soldiers raising the flag of the Viet Cong at 0800 hours. They will hold more than half the city, including the ancient walled citadel, for three weeks. As South Vietnamese forces attempt to quell the enemy, U.S. Marines from the 1st Battalion of Task Force X-Ray arrive from their base eight miles south of the city. The bloody and intense fighting rages for 26 days. Marines of the 1st and 5th Regiments are forced to fight house to house, retaking the city a block at a time. Yet still, Communist forces hold the Imperial Citadel and southern half of the city. The Marines are given permission by the South Vietnamese to use shells and artillery on the historic, ancient structure of the Citadel. It is February 29th when U.S. forces finally reclaim the Citadel and force the North Vietnamese out. The Citadel, the soldiers discover, is the site of a massacre. Entire classes of citizens, from intellectuals to religious leaders, have been taken from their homes by the Viet Cong and executed. Buried in mass graves, a total of nearly 2,800 bodies will be discovered over the next few years. It may be deemed a victory on paper, but with 80% of the city destroyed by Air Force airstrikes and the surviving civilians left homeless, it is Pyrrhic at best. Back in the United States, the media coverage of Hue reveals to the populace the effects of war firsthand. It is the turning point in the American public's perception of the war as the media brings it straight to their television screens. I was really disappointed because my dad was sending me newspapers uh, which would get there about a week after uh, uh, he had sent them. They would go and claim that, you know, uh, that units were completely wiped out when they weren't and uh, or uh, there was a battle and they would say that uh, three Americans were killed, but they also would fail to say that the, uh, 100 North Vietnamese were killed in that very same battle. And it was very one-sided, uh, basically supporting the North Vietnamese and uh, uh, biased to the fact that they were, you know, uh, implying that the North Vietnamese were winning the war when the opposite was true. Battles raged throughout South Vietnam. But Allied forces emerged victorious, with the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces decimated. 
The Great Decimation of the Viet Cong Ranks creates an imbalance between the two communist allies, with the North Vietnamese gaining more power in the alliance. Enemy forces lose thousands of men, 8,113 according to the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, while U.S. losses are 216 killed and 1,584 wounded, and the South Vietnamese 452 with 2,123 wounded. A total of about 58,000 people are lost from all sides. The combined forces of the U.S. and the South Vietnamese were successful in defeating the communist forces with much credit going to General Wayland for having the foresight to defend Saigon. The U.S. military reacts with search and destroy sweeps throughout Saigon and South Vietnam hoping to eliminate refugee enemy soldiers. March 16, 1968. After the Tet Offensive, Viet Cong soldiers are suspected of hiding out in the village of Son Mi. The area, known as Pinkville, is known for being highly booby-trapped by the Viet Cong. Charlie Company of the 1st Battalion, 20th Infantry Regiment, 11th Brigade, 23rd Infantry, suffers 28 casualties in their first few months in South Vietnam. The orders given to the angry soldiers is clear. This is what you've been waiting for. Search and destroy, and you've got it. Yeah, I heard about some of the guys going out there in the villes and uh, talking about blowing away people. And you know, you see your buddies getting shot next to you, you're getting hit at night, and you can't do nothing. And, uh, you know, some guys did go off a little bit, too. You know, I've seen some guys, even in fact, shoot themselves to get out of the field because they didn't want to be out there. The troopers, under the command of Lieutenant William Calley, enter the village on a search and destroy mission that quickly becomes a massacre. Over 300 unarmed civilians are killed, including women, children, and the elderly. One girl is raped and murdered. Callie allegedly orders a group of villagers to line up by an open ditch and shoots them down with his machine gun. One of my flight instructors uh, was with the AmeriCal Division and he used to fly over the, the uh, four Malai vi vi villages. And once uh, Lieutenant Callie went through Malai Four, I think that, that was the number of the village that the uh, massacre uh, happened in, he said that they never, be, prior to that, they would always receive uh, enemy fire from the Malai villages. He said after it happened, they never received one enemy uh, round fired at them. I couldn't believe it. First thing I saw, thought was Lieutenant Callie being used as a scapegoat, because where was his sergeant? Where was the sergeant, and why wasn't he keeping his men in line? Around 0900, Warrant Officer Hugh Clowers Thompson, Jr. flies back over My Lai in his observation helicopter to provide air support for the infantry below. He and his crew witness Captain Ernest Medina executing a woman point blank. Then they see the ditch full of bodies. After an altercation with Callie, Thompson lands his helicopter between 10 civilians fleeing from soldiers from 2nd Platoon, C Company. Evacuating the villagers with the help of two UH-1 Huey gunships and saving a young boy buried with the dead in the ditch, Thompson furiously makes an official report of the killings upon his return to base. The operation's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Barker, immediately seeks an answer from Medina, who then orders a ceasefire to Charlie Company. In the effort to cover up the My Lai Massacre, the government rewards Thompson with the Distinguished Flying Cross. It cites Thompson for saving a Vietnamese child and for enhancing Vietnamese-American relations in the operational area. Thompson throws the citation away in disgust. March 22nd, 1968. Our main thing was that siege at Quezon with the Marines and um, they were really taking a beating up there. And then one day they moved us up to Quezon, which was 
uh, the first time that I ever think we had incoming artillery, we were sent up there to shoot at some guns that were in the, in the mountain that were shooting at the uh, Marine base. It, it just seemed different that coming back at you, you never knew what artillery was. You were always the one shooting it out. And then uh, we had tanks coming after us. We had troop movements all around us. And then eventually the rest of the 1st Cav Infantry walked in the caisson and took care of a lot of stuff there and relieved the Marines at the base. And I noticed some Marines that ain't going to say that story is true. <laughs> Since the initial attack, Quezon continues to withstand enemy barrages. The Marines build bunkers to withstand the enemy's 82 millimeter rounds. Things get quiet on March 6th. That is about to change. North Vietnamese forces restart their bombardment of the fort at a rate of 100 rounds every hour. The U.S. retaliates with bombing. It is not until April 8th that the siege ends. 77 days since the attacks started, over 1,600 North Vietnamese soldiers have been killed. Countless thousands more were killed by the bombings, their bodies blown to bits as the Americans abandon and destroy Khe Sanh by June. Both sides claim victory. It is, at best, a hollow one. Meanwhile, positive public perception of the war continues to wane. After his own trip to Vietnam, respected journalist Walter Cronkite offers his own view on the war in February, calling the war in Vietnam a stalemate. He says, the only rational way out, then, will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. America is startled. You know, we were in North Vietnam for the uh, Tet Offensive. This is supposed to be the, uh, the big, it's the thing, and Walter Cronkite says, oh God, we gotta get out of here, this is awful. Our losses were minuscule in, in uh, the Tet Offensive compared to the North Vietnamese, which lost 25% of its male population between uh, the ages of 19 and 21. And you think, that's incredible. They were on their knees, ready to, to uh, throw in the towel, and then uh, LBJ offered them peace talks, and they couldn't, they couldn't believe it. They said, God, this is one, I can't believe these idiots. North Vietnam rushed their preparations for a savage assault on the people the government, and the allies of South Vietnam. Their attack during the Tet Holidays failed to achieve its principal objective. It did not collapse the elected government of South Vietnam or shatter its army as the communists had hoped. It did not. The Communist forces did incur a military loss in the Tet Offensive, but it was a psychological victory against the United States and against its commander-in-chief. The intense fighting of the Tet Offensive, as in any battle, leaves a trail of wounded in its wake. Tending to these wounded heroes are always the field medics and nurses. Vietnam was no exception. While much focus is put on the men going to Vietnam through either enlisting or in the draft, approximately 7,484 women served in the war. 83.5% or 6,250 served as nurses in field hospitals. These nurses served in Navy hospital ships, on Air Force airlift helicopters, and in Army field hospitals. We had a saying that if you if you got to our got to the hospital, you had a 99% chance of surviving, surviving Vietnam. Now, what happened to these individuals when they went down the chain of command, whether they died of complications later, we wouldn't know. But we were able to stabilize them and keep them alive if we got you 90% of the time. And we were very proud of that. The Vietnam War is the first to use helicopters to transport the wounded and dying to receive medical care 
and hospitals were situated to take these wounded soldiers and civilians brought in by airlift. We were in Quinyan, which is the city on the, on the uh, ocean, or South China Sea. The Army was very proud to say that if you were uh, wounded out in the field, that you were only 15 minutes away from medical care. So you went to the nearest medical facility, which could be in a VAC hospital, a clearing company, or a mass unit. Then a couple times a week, I was in a VAC hospital, but we would have what was called a regurge from the surge, which meant all the choppers would come in with patients who were in other areas. And sometimes our OR would be running up to 72 hours because they would come through our triage area, go to pre-op, then they would go to surgery, then they would go to post-op, then they would go to the units, to the nursing units. After that, after a few days, if they were stabilized, the Air Force would came in, come in and evacuated them to Japan or the Philippines or Guam. So it was steady flow of patients. You would maybe know a patient for three or four days and that was it. The combat nurses regularly worked 12-hour shifts, six days a week, serving not only the soldiers brought in from battle, but also volunteering and administering medical aid to the local South Vietnamese population. Their schedules are physically and psychologically grueling as they were often overtaxed at the end of major battles. We worked 12 hours, seven days a week, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., or 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. You go get supper or breakfast, whatever, and then you go to bed, get up and do it all over again. And you just, your main job was to take care of the soldiers, the casualties as they came in. As the war starts in 1965, there are only 113 hospital beds and 15 nurses in South Vietnam. By 1968, the buildup of medical units is completed, adding 11 reserve and National Guard units. 900 nurses are serving 23 Army hospitals and one convalescent center, with a total of 5,283 beds. Nurses average 23 years of age, with only 35% of them having more than two years' experience. 79% are women, and 21% are male nurses. As these nurses enter their 12-month tour of service, they are flown directly to the Tan Son Nut Air Base before processing for their assignments. Most field hospitals are located on large airfields in close proximity to division headquarters or troop concentrations. Due to their vulnerability in the war zone, hospitals were not always spared from the ravages of war. Because of this, they are heavily guarded. We weren't close to the front lines, but a lot of times the front lines would come to us. Sometimes the VC would uh, surround Quinyon, and we would be on alert. We would have to go to uh, our hospital unit. We would go on the floors, take care of the patients. The, met, they, the armory would break out the M16s, give to the medics. The medics would form a perimeter. Luckily, while I was there, we didn't have any problem. We weren't overrun. The patients, of course, were upset. I would tell them, don't worry. If they don't put a gun in my hand, we're safe. <laughs> don't worry until they put that M16 in my hand, boys. Many nurses wear light olive cotton fatigues rather than a traditional white uniform. Their service goes beyond the battlefield and armed forces as Army nurses regularly move out to clinics established for the civilian population, providing immunization and basic medical care. They also conduct sick calls to Vietnamese homes and orphanages. Usually if you had to travel a distance, you went in chopper, but you could look down. And if you're on a river, if you follow the river, you can see oxen and that type of thing. You can see people out in the field picking rice, conical hats. You, you can see, see the Vietnamese community. Battlefield injuries are actually outnumbered by disease and infections, marking 69% of all admissions. The unforgiving environment and warfare leaves soldiers to struggle with infection caused by flying debris, as well as battlefield injuries from explosions and gunfire. 
advances in medical technology since World War II, results in shorter hospital stays, as well as a lower mortality rate amongst patients, 2.6% per thousand over the 4.5% of the World War II era. At 6.01 p.m., Dr. King is shot and killed by a single bullet fired by a white man, James Earl Ray. In response, riots erupt in over 100 U.S. cities. New York Senator Robert F. Kennedy, campaigning for the 1968 Democratic presidential nomination, breaks the news of Dr. King's death to an audience in a predominantly black neighborhood in Indianapolis, Indiana. Almost two months to the day, on June 5th, Robert F. Kennedy is himself assassinated, mere minutes after winning the California Democratic primaries. The government, both on and off America's shores, is in a chaotic state. General William Westmoreland continues to request additional soldiers in Vietnam, 200,000 more, in what has become a war of attrition. President Johnson calls Westmoreland back with an offer to become chief of staff for the U.S. Army. Westmoreland's tenure in Vietnam has seen an increase from 20,000 American troops to 500,000. Removing Westmoreland directly from the Vietnam equation, he is replaced by General Creighton Abrams. Westmoreland's deputy since May of the prior year, Abrams takes a clear and hold approach to the war. His plan is to break units into smaller groups and, rather than simply go after the enemy, train the South Vietnamese forces to defend themselves. Is the war in Vietnam beyond the point of no return? America faces its own social uncertainties as President Johnson prepares to step down from office. With the military failure for the communists of the Tet Offensive and the U.S.'s own disenchantment, preliminary peace talks between Hanoi and Washington, D.C. quickly deadlock. Washington wants all North Vietnamese troops removed from South Vietnam, while North Vietnam refuses to recognize a provisional government in South Vietnam under the leadership of Nguyen Van Thu. The hope towards an end is overshadowed by America's distrust in its own government and anxiety over the war. With Robert Kennedy dead, pro-Vietnam Vice President Hubert Humphreys stands to take the Democratic nomination. In response, thousands of students converge on the Chicago Democratic Convention to protest the inevitable nomination. Anti-war demonstrators clash with police, the Illinois National Guard, the Army, and Secret Service over a five-day period. August 28th, the third day of the convention, is dubbed the Battle of Michigan Avenue. Chicago police beat, tear gas, and arrest protesters. 589 arrests are made, with 100 protesters and 119 police injured. Like with the Battle of Hue, the press coverage conveys the disorder in America. The Republican convention produces former Vice President and John F. Kennedy's 1960 rival, Richard Milhouse Nixon, as their candidate. Nixon paints himself as a stable figure who appeals to the socially conservative World War II generation in a bid to restore peace in Vietnam and rebuild the once proud America. The choice we make in 1968 will determine not only the future of America, but the future of peace and freedom in the world for the last third of the 20th century. And the question that we answer tonight, can America meet this great challenge? As part of the United States plan to strengthen the South Vietnamese armed forces through training, Operation Sea Lords, standing for Southeast Asia Lake, Ocean, River, and Delta Strategy, is conceived by Elmo R. Zumwalt, Jr., Commander, Naval Forces, Vietnam. Our direct senior boss would be Admiral Zumwalt, who later became Chief of Navy Personnel in the United States. 
and he's actually gotten nicknamed the father of the Brownwater Navy because a lot of his ideas that we were using in Vietnam came from him as far as designing craft, how to patrol, how to supply, and things like that. Vice Admiral Zumwalt is appointed in September 1968. Prior, he had served in World War II and earned a Bronze Star with Valor device during the battle for Leyte Gulf. After that, he served throughout the Navy, ever the sailor, and earned a rear admiral ranking. Just a month after his appointment as commander in Vietnam, he is promoted to vice admiral. His command is a brown water unit, including the countless swift boats that diligently patrol the rivers and harbors of South Vietnam. People don't realize that you really don't have a free time in, in a war zone. A lot of people say, you know, it's like 10% action and 90% being dull, okay? But the type of work we did, we were constantly moving, so you really didn't have that pleasure of having a dull time. Sea Lord's primary military goal is to disrupt North Vietnamese supply lines from Cambodia and into South Vietnam via the Mekong Delta. Working in tandem with South Vietnam's Navy and Allied ground forces, the operation will disrupt this invaluable North Vietnamese supply line. The Coastal Surveillance Force features 81 swift boats, 26 Coast Guard Point Class cutters, and 39 other boats. The River Patrol Force boasts 250 patrol and minesweepers. The Riverine Assault Force has 184 monitors and other armored craft, and a helicopter attack squadron, Light 3, with 25 armed helicopters. The South Vietnamese Navy bring their fleet of 655 ships, patrol boats, and assault craft. Five Navy SEAL platoons also augment sea lords. The communists are still reeling from their battlefield losses from the Tet Offensive and are pushed out to the border areas by Allied forces. Former Viet Cong strongholds are overtaken by U.S. forces and restored to the South Vietnamese, while the Viet Cong are forced towards the border area. Phase one of Sea Lords sees the Allied forces creating patrol barriers throughout the waterways parallel to the Cambodian border, primarily through the use of electronic sensors. That December sees U.S. naval forces pushing up the waterways from Cambodia's Parrot's Beak area to cut off vital supply routes for the Viet Cong right at their own base and rest area. Despite heavy opposition, Operation Slingshot grants the Allies ownership of the routes to and from Cambodia. The waterways northwest of Saigon to the Gulf of Siam are in Allied hands, hampering the enemy forces. Operation Sea Lords is a success. By October 1969, one year after the start of the Sea Lords campaign, communist military forces in the Mekong Delta were under heavy pressure. The successive border interdiction barriers delayed and disrupted the enemy's resupply and troop replacement from Cambodia. The raiding operations hit vulnerable base areas and the sea float deployment put Allied forces deep into what had been a Viet Cong sanctuary. In addition, American and Vietnamese forces captured or destroyed over 500 tons of enemy weapons, ammunition, food, medicines, and other supplies. Furthermore, 3,000 communist soldiers were killed and 300 were captured at a cost of 186 Allied men killed and 1,451 wounded. By 1970, the South Vietnamese Navy will take full ownership of Operation Sea Lords, exhibiting the success of Vietnamization. November 1st, 1968. Operation Rolling Thunder, the United States air bombing campaign, is put to an end. It has cost America 900 aircraft with 818 pilots dead or MIA. Hundreds more are taken as prisoners of war by the North Vietnamese. Nearly 300,000 attacks have been run between Air Force, Navy, 
and Marine Corps. The amount of artillery already eclipses the tons dropped during the Korean War, as well as World War II. While the North Vietnamese have only lost 120 planes, an estimated 182,000 civilians are caught in the line of fire and killed. That preceding January, the CIA has estimated $370 million in damage inflicted on North Vietnam. November 6th, 1968. The electoral fight for the White House reaches an historical conclusion as Richard Nixon wins by a slim margin. His promise and vow to the American people is to end the Vietnam War through his own secret plan and with an honorable peace that will maintain the U.S.'s position as a world superpower. January 29th, 1969. Richard Milhouse Nixon is sworn in as the 37th President of the United States. For the first time, because the people of the world want peace and the leaders of the world are afraid of war, the times are on the side of peace. Eight years from now, America will celebrate its 200th anniversary as a nation. And within the lifetime of most people now living, mankind will celebrate that great new year which comes only once in a thousand years, the beginning of the third millennium. What kind of a nation we will be, what kind of a world we will live in, whether we shape the future in the image of our hopes is ours is to determine by our actions and our choices. The greatest honor history can bestow is the title of peacemaker. This honor now beckons America, the chance to help lead the world at last out of the valley of turmoil and onto that high ground of peace that man has dreamed of since the dawn of civilization. If we succeed, generations to come will say of us now living that we mastered our moment, that we helped make the world safe for mankind. This is our summons to greatness. And I believe the American people are ready to answer this call. Many of the American people hope, beyond hope, for an end to the war. December, 1968. U.S. command in Saigon enacts Operation Speedy Express. This accelerated pacification program focuses on the Mekong Delta province of Kien Ho, a nerve center of the Viet Cong. Speedy Express's focus is meant to disrupt the Viet Cong by severing their supply lines and eliminating enemy supporters. Kien Ho was also a thriving community with thousands of families living out their daily lives. Yet the U.S. air and ground strikes go forward. Kien Ho receives the brunt of the 3,381 airstrikes. At the end of Speedy Express on May 31, 1969, estimates of enemy dead are 10,889, with only 748 weapons seized. Many of the supposed enemy are gunned down in a shoot-first, ask-questions-later manner. If a Vietnamese is unarmed, they are shot before they can reach a potentially hidden firearm. It will be three more years until the American people learn of Speedy Express. By the end of December 1968, there are 549,500 U.S. troops in Vietnam. The war's price tag of $77 billion, $350 million pales in comparison to the 16,592 American lives lost. It is the year with the greatest number of casualties. All soldiers are, are you know, wanting to go home and, and they're all looking for peace. I don't care whether it was the First World War, Second World War, or Vietnam. Uh, 
you know, there's no soldier that, that or no, no American that values peace more than the American soldier who's been in combat. And uh, uh, they, uh, you can ask one of these, these are one of our, our soldiers that's over in Afghanistan right now, the very same thing. Vietnam's neighbor, Cambodia, continues to vex the United States. Per the 1954 Geneva Accord, the country is still technically neutral. Prince Norodom Sihanouk, however, has allowed the Viet Cong to set up headquarters and use the Cambodian port of Sihanoukville. Prince Sihanouk agrees to reopen diplomacy with the United States towards the end of 1968. While dealing with the prince on a diplomatic level, President Nixon opts to tackle the Viet Cong problem in Cambodia. Nixon flies in the face of government restrictions in authorizing Operation Menu, a covert bombing of Cambodia. March 18th, 1969. A month after an aggressive Viet Cong attack on American bases and Saigon leaves 1,140 Americans dead, President Nixon signs off on the first strike against enemy bases in Cambodia. 60 B-52 bombers dropped 2,400 tons of bombs on the supposed Viet Cong base. Considered successful, 15 more sites follow. Nixon and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, do their best to keep the strikes top secret. Congress is not informed, and Nixon plants phony telephone logs to cover his tracks. They are, however, exposed when New York Times reporter William M. Beecher learns of Operation Menu from an anonymous government source. The May 9th article infuriates Nixon, who first suspects Kissinger's aide, Morton Halperin, of the leak, and he starts a spate of unrecorded and illegal FBI wiretaps. In spite of this, however, Operation Menu continues for another year. The end of 1968 marks the bloodiest year of the war in Vietnam. And the start of 1969? By that April, the war has already eclipsed the 33,269 men who were killed in the Korean War a decade earlier. But there is still more, for the war is far from over, and the country will find itself faced with even more questions in the coming days. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.